All right. So welcome to the Kelly and Bloor Partners Freshwater Biome Travel Package Unveiling. Yes, we are offering a vacation travel package with the freshwater biome and its surface water reservoirs. Okay. So to give y'all a general overview of the freshwater biome, we are going to look at lakes, rivers, and streams, and we're gonna tell you what that is. Okay, so freshwater biomes are large communities of plants and animals centered around waters with less than 1% salt concentration. Yes, lakes vary significantly in size, ranging from just a few square meters to thousands of square kilometers. A lake can be broken up into four distinct components, of which are classified as zones with diversified factors. Uh, the littoral zone, lunatic zone, profundal zone, and benthic zone. Yes, the benthic zone is the bottom zone. Uh, the littoral zone is where you'll find emergent plants and algae. The limnetic zone is the upper region of the surface water, and photosynthesis happens here as well. Rivers, on the other hand, rivers also come in a wide variety, spanning from smaller streams and wetlands to large-scale waterways. Additionally, it is observed that rivers originate from a source, or headwaters, and they usually comprise an immense network of tributaries and rip deltas. And tributaries are these small uh, streams that feed into another river and a larger waterway. Rivers are known to have a have higher productivity than streams. That's you know because of that of that DO level. Okay, so on the right we have these diagrams showing you the actual um, outline of and the components that make up lakes and rivers. Okay, so first we're going to get into biotic factors, and I'm going to give this to my botanist, um, Karis Bloor. Um, she's going to cover plant life. Okay. So first we have the purple loose stripe, and it's a very invasive flowering species, but it's very pretty. And it's from Asia and Europe, and it is a really nice flower in this biome. It is in both tidal and non-tidal marshes and rivers. It is threatening and it's displacing native species, but it's pretty to look at. And I think that that's a really nice component to this trip. Um, and it arrived via ships. And then we have the white water lily, which is native to northeastern U.S. It is naturally found in Maine, Michigan, Minnesota, as well as Washington, Idaho, and Canada. And it's an ornamental and brings aesthetic services to a pond and it also can be found in rivers. Um, it also attracts wildlife and brings in other animals, which eat it for its seeds and other parts and components of it. And then it attracts birds as well, which helps maintain biodiversity and sustain species. And also just adds the attractiveness of the biome. Then we have freshwater blue green algae. Um, and this is in the plant kingdom, but it is technically not a plant. It resides in sites such as streams and rivers, and this is also called cyanobacteria, which is one of the most common types of uh, algae and provides many benefits to an ecosystem such as fixing nitrogen, producing oxygen for other life, filtering water, and providing the basis for most freshwater food webs. They're also very sensitive to pH, change and they're good indicators of water quality and then these can be very dangerous if an excess amount of nutrients is present as they can bloom which lowers the oxygen levels making a habit inhabitable for certain organisms. And then there's the Canadian pondweed which um, is not really that valuable as a food source but it is submerged and provides a habitat for many micro and macro invertebrates. Uh, this species makes food for other species, and the decomposition of these plants provide nutrients for the invertebrates as well. And they are found in marshes, rivers, and streams in many areas within the Western Hemisphere. And then there's the Northern Water Milfoil, and it's an aquatic plant species that resides in la lakes, ponds, and rivers. This species is consumed by many waterfowl and they provide shade, shelter, and hunting grounds for fish. They can be very thick though and limit fishing, boating, and other recreational activities. And they are native to New England, Maine, and other places. All right, so now we're going to switch to the animal life. And Karis is also our zoologist. So 
I'm going to have her present the animal life as well. So we have the bluegill, which is a popular sport fish, and it inhabits streams, ponds, lagoons, and other small to medium-sized lakes. Uh, they are found in shady areas near um, um, or in aquatic vegetation, and major habitats for them are weed beds. They eat uh, with, they're very opportunistic, so they take what they can get and they eat insects, uh, insect larvae, worms, and um, small crustaceans. Swelling season begins in late May and the male arrives to the site and makes a bed in shallow water. And bluegills are generally sexually mature at one year of age and the male will stay with the 10,000 to 60,000 eggs until they hatch. And then they go and live by themselves. And then we have the pumpkin seed. These fish are native to the Great Lakes, Upper Mississippi, and East Coast drainages from New Brunswick, uh, south to North, uh, to South Carolina. This species is very colorful and is distinguished mainly by a red spot on the operculum, as well as their green backs, red spots, and orange bottom. They also have bluish streaks, which come from and advance from the eyes and mouth. And they are capable of living in both lentic and lotic habitats. And um, these sunfish generally are near aquatic vegetation at the lines uh, that line the shore of ponds and lakes. Um, for rivers and streams, they can be commonly found in backwaters and deeper pools with little currents, um, but they can also be in faster, more fluid areas too. This species consumes invertebrates out on the plants or the bottom, and they also eat shelled creatures such as snails. For reproduction, they make... Anyways, for reproduction, the males dig nests in shallow waters and the females will come and reproduce with the males in the nest uh, that, and then the males will defend the eggs until they hatch. Now we have the crayfish. A majority of crayfish are in freshwater, although some are in brackish water. They are common in lakes and streams, often under rocks or logs. They are active most during the night, and during this time they consume snails, worms, insects, larvae, and amphibian tadpoles, as well as vegetation. They lay eggs during the spring and mate previously in the fall, and the larvae hatch and remain on the mom's body for many weeks, and they detach and reach sexual maturity within a few months to years. Um, a major part of virtually every freshwater ecosystem as they comprise the foundation of the food chain and their predators or their predators are reptiles, amphibians, fish, and birds. Next we have the mallard which inhabits North America as well as Asia and Europe. They live in marshes, lakes, swamps, rivers, streams, and ponds. For the most part their diet primarily consists of plants and they eat the stems, seeds, leaves, and sedges of aquatic plants, and they also eat grasses. Sometimes they will consume crustins and mollusks and insects too. The species begins having relationships in the fall, and by winter, relationships are stabilized. If a part of, migra of a migratory group, the pair will go to the female's territory. The female lays eggs in a nest that is generally less than 100 yards from a water source. The female incubates these eggs. Um, and during this time, the male leaves and migrates, and when hatched, the mother will lead the ducklings to the pond. And the mother takes care of the chicks until they are eight months old and fledged. These ducklings will develop the maturity to mate, in which they mate with a duck of a different species, generally. Now, we have the common snapping turtle. These animals are commonly found in eastern North America and inhabit almost every type of freshwater habitat within their range, such as marshes, bogs, creeks, swamps, lakes, pools, streams, and rivers. They do have a preference, though, and they prefer water bodies with soft bottoms and abundant aquatic vegetation. They spend most of their time in their water and rarely are basking, contrary to popular belief, and they are partially reserved and docile, but will strike quickly if needed at moments. These animals are omnivores and eat aquatic vegetation, many types of vertebrates and invertebrates. They will also consume fish, reptiles, worms, and birds, as well as dead animals too. The young will go and look for the food, but the older will sneak up on their prey by laying motionlessly and quickly snapping. And they mate from April to November and typically have 20 to 40 eggs, which they will keep in concave nests dug by the mother on land. The mother will make this nest and over a few hours will cover the eggs, but after that will return to water and leave them to fend on their own. And the temperature determines the sex. 
After 80 to 90 days, the eggs hatch and the turtles head to the water to survive on their own, and when the carapace reaches 8 inches, they are ready to mate. Alright, so just to truly encompass the idea that the freshwater biome is a global um, scale, um, I have some information about the climate and location here, uh, which is a generalization um, that covers the aggregate scope of the freshwater biome. So the climate is determined by its location, volume, and current season with the freshwater biome. Over 68% of the freshwater on Earth is found in ice caps and glaciers, and just over 30% is found in groundwater. So only about 0.3% of our freshwater is found in the surface water of lakes, rivers, and swamps. So here we have a map of the relative location and just the general location of all freshwater uh, bodies of water um, on the Earth of, of surface water. And we have the different classifications with different climates and locations of our freshwater biome. So to make it a little bit easier, we have selected six different uh, freshwater um, bodies of water uh, locations for our vacation travel package. So first we're going to start with Lake Baikal. It is the world's largest lake by volume, and this lake contains about one-fifth of the Earth's fresh water and has a maximum depth of 5,315 feet. It is located in Russia in south-central Siberia region. Uh, the average temperature is negative 6 degrees Fahrenheit in winter and about 52 degrees Fahrenheit in the fall and 23 degrees Fahrenheit in the summer. Lake Baikal freezes over from January until late May or June. The average precipitation in August is approximately 92 millimeters and the maximum average is 116 millimeters in July. For the best time to visit, all right, so for the best time to visit, August and September in that range have a more moderate range of conditions, right? So you're going to be seeing lower, um, lower precipitation rates uh, than the actual summer months. And it, the, the temperature is going to be more moderate, right? It's going to be more tolerable for people visiting from the warmer regions closer to the equator. But remember to bring a light jacket, long pants, long sleeve and short sleeve shirts, and perhaps shorts if the weather is not too chilly. Um, in addition, a winter jacket is always a necessity when traveling to Russia. And here are some nice photos of Lake Baikal in the um, summer and well, in the winter and uh, fall and summer months. So, um, on the northwest side of the lake, the Baikal Mountains are a breathtaking sight to see, bordering the Siberian Plateau, composing a picture perfect landscape. I can tell you it is absolutely beautiful. And, and another beautiful spot to admire is the famous Cape Burkhan. And that is a, a, a big rock um, collection right there in the middle of the lake. Lake Superior, this is our second option. Uh, it's the world's largest lake by surface area. That's right. So this is in America, right? It's uh, between Canada and America. Um, located north of Michigan and Wisconsin, bordering the upper, up the upper peninsula and south of Ontario. The climate in Superior is described as cold and temperate by the locals. Annual air temperatures fluctuate between negative 20 degrees Fahrenheit and 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And January is the coldest month with an average temperature of negative 8 degrees Fahrenheit. June is the wettest month with an average rainfall of 114 millimeters. July is the best month to visit Lake Superior because of its severe weather uh, condition, uh, because of its lack of severe weather conditions, uh, or yes, it, because of its severe weather conditions in the fall and winter, we want to avoid those, right? The locals state that also wind chill is a major concern for Superior, and it is something to be considered whenever visiting Lake Superior. Remember to bring a jacket, long pants, long sleeve shirt, and for the brave ones, maybe a bathing suit, particularly sunglasses and a fishing hat are always encouraged. There are a lot of things to do here, and we are going to go over those. Lake Superior. So although we recommend vacationing to Lake Superior in July, the Amsoil um, Duluth National so Snow Cross is an annual snow snowmobile race that clients love to attend. And nestled between the uh, Munising and Grand Marais, is the pictured Rocks National Lakeshore. This is a this is truly a diamond in the rough as a 40 mile reach of pristine beaches and cascading sandstone cliffs. You must go and see this. It is absolutely beautiful. 
Lake Victoria, so this is our third option. It is located in eastern Africa, bordering Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania. The climate of this area acts inversely to the to a typical freshwater biome in the northern hemisphere. May, June, July, and August experience a moderate mean monthly rainfall pattern, and October has the highest average precipitation at 28 millimeters. To avoid the volatile precipitation derivatives of the winter, the optimal time to visit Lake Victoria is that March through April range, that, that little interval of time that is perfect right there. And the region does get rather cold during the middle of the year with mean daily temperatures ranging from 32 degrees Fahrenheit to 59 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, be sure to pack your closed-toed shoes and water shoes, a tank top, shorts, long sleeve, button-up shirt, fishing hat, sunglasses, sunscreen, and my personal favorite, always bring a Columbia jacket with you whenever you are traveling. It is, it is so comfortable. So for stuff to see here, uh, Lake Victoria, uh, so we have, uh, it is rich uh, with fossils dating back um, to 18 million years, and once the epicenter of an archaeological uh, uh, dig site, which found fragments of historical artifacts to human evolution, Rasinga Island is an isolated paradise that sustains the lakeside village of Mbita. It is located off the northeastern shoreline near the Wenham Gulf of Kenya. So yes, there is a island that is in the northeastern part of this lake that has an archaeological dig site and a lush um, an ecosystem with a lakeside village. So for our fourth option, we have the Ganges River. So we're going to uh, uh, switch from the lakes to rivers. Um, this is located in northern India and Bangladesh. The average rainfall, the average annual rainfall varies from 30 inches in the westernmost part to more than 90 inches at the eastern end. In the delta region, the mean rainfall is between 60 and 100 inches. This region also experiences strong cyclonic storms before and after the monsoon season, which is March through May and September through October. The average maximum temperature across the basin is 87.7 degrees Fahrenheit in the, in the summer and 70 degrees Fahrenheit in the winter. The average minimum temperature is 71 degrees Fahrenheit in the summer and 44 degrees Fahrenheit in the winter. As for the hottest time of the year, the pre-monsoon season reports an average temperature of 89 degrees Fahrenheit, with June being the hottest month in the upper basin in May and the lower. The coldest month is January across the entire basin. And to report the best time to travel here, guys, it is November. November is a sweet spot for temperature range, 57 to 82 degrees Fahrenheit, with a low mean rainfall. That's right. Remember to pack your closed-toed shoes, hats and sunglasses, long sleeve and short sleeve shirts, and extra socks. Okay. The Ganges River proffers an assortment of cultural and economic utilities to the people and the surrounding towns and the cities. So we have irrigation provisioning systems as a lot of uh, religious religious stuff as well. Uh, you can visit the um, Annapurna uh, Babani Temple, which was dedicated to Annapurna and serves as a religious site for worship and ceremonies in the Hindu faith. And go on a dolphin watching um, excursion with the river dolphins. Yes, that is a very exciting thing that clients love to go do. So I highly suggest that you choose this one as well. The Yangtze River this is located in southeastern China. The temperature in the spring ranges from 54 to 65 degrees Fahrenheit. In autumn, the average temperature is 60 degree, uh, th 63 degrees Fahrenheit. As a primary component of the weather conditions, fog is quite common in the Yangtze River Basin, and it is usually humid with little sunshine. Its 1,067 millimeter average annual precipitation is not distributed evenly across the year, with heavy rains and strong winds approaching in the monsoon season. The, uh, the precipitation in winter, December through January, is the least of the year, but increases gradually in spring, which is March through May. In June and July, the precipitation is more than 200 millimeters in the middle and lower reaches of the Yangtze River. In August, the main, the main rain area goes on to the upper reaches, and the precipitation in autumn, September through November, reduces gradually. So because of this expected humidity and temperatures, make sure you pack extra t-shirts, socks, and undergarments. And on top of this, bring a fishing hat and rugged water shoes for the river experience. Yes, yeah, so I would probably say, you know, roughly um, August, uh, the best time. Now, August would be the best time to visit the Yangtze River, definitely. So when you vacation to the Yangtze River, the Three Gorges Dam is a must-see site along the way. It incorporates 28 million cubic meters, about 37 million cubic yards of concrete, and 463,000 metric tons of steel into its design. 
The dam has created an immense deep water reservoir, allowing ocean-going freighters to navigate 2,250 kilometers, about 1,400 miles, inland from Shanghai. Uh, while operating at full capacity, wow, the dam generates 22,500 megawatts of electricity, making it the most productive hydroelectric dam in the world. And lastly, for our sixth option, we have the Amazon River. That's right, so located across northern South America, the climate of Amazonia is warm, humid, and rainy. The day and night cycles are equal in length, which is very interesting. There's a greater difference between daytime and, night and midnight temperatures than between the warmest and coolest months. Hence, night can be considered the winter of the Amazon. At Manaus, the average daily temperature is in the upper 80s degrees Fahrenheit and about 32 degrees Celsius in September and the mid 70s uh, degrees Fahrenheit, about 24 degrees Celsius in April. But the humidity is consistently high and often oppressive throughout the year. Uh, the main influx of atmospheric water vapor into the basin comes from the east, right? So about half of the precipitation that falls originates from the Atlantic Ocean. The other half comes from evapotranspiration from the tropical rainforest um, and associated convectional storms. Rainfall in the lowlands typically ranges from 60 to 120 inches which is about 1,500 to 3,000 millimeters annually in the central Amazon basin. Um, on the eastern and northwestern margins of the basin, rainfall occurs, occurs year-round, whereas the central part, there is a definite drier period, um, usually from June to November. So August is the ideal month to plan a vacation because of its relatively low precipitation rates. Certainly, pack a sufficient quantity of short sleeve shirts and cargo pants, bring bug spray, hats, rugged shoes, and enough socks to last through the high humidity. So there, here's some things to see and do at the Amazon River. So piranha fishing is a popular activity among travelers to the um, Amazon River. And yes, piranhas are actually de depicted as these scary creatures um, in pop culture, but they are actually quite passive uh, with people that travel to the Amazon River. You can actually swim in the Amazon River. Similar to the Ganges, um, pink dolphins are rare and unique to the Amazon or in Orinoco. Uh, rivers in South America, and you will most likely see pink river dolphins during your time in the Amazon. Of course, there is also the Amazon rainforest with high biodiversity and productivity, yielding a lush canopy with various plant and animal species. All right, so that is our six offerings of the freshwater biome, and we are offering three different packages this year. Yes, three different packages, They're all very exciting and interesting stuff. We have our silver package. You can buy one vacation site experience for $995 a person in the travel group. There is also the gold package, which is a selection of three luxurious vacation sites for $1,990 per person in the travel group. And we also have the platinum package, so you can get all six of these premium vacation sites for $4,975 per person in the travel group. And here is our Works Cited page. And... We thank you for joining us in our freshwater biome vacation travel experience. And y'all have a great day. Thank you.